Hello there friends, this is Dota News, we're here to create the best Dota News channel ever, here's what we cover in today's episode. Valve seriously scammed the Dota 2 community, DDoS attackers take on Gaben, Arteezy's teammates are feeders, the world's best of laner has been revealed, and much more. Without further ado, let's get straight to it. Let's kick off our new segment with LeBron Dota, who decided to focus on his physical appearance and signed up for the gym. And wow, just listen to this, thanks to this commitment he's managed to lose an impressive 30 kilos, considering he has also 11k MMR on his main account and plays for a professional team. I think it's an excellent example of self-discipline, huge respect, good job LeBron. Let's not stray far from the achievements of esports athletes, as Watson has shared the path of his career. According to the pro player before joining Entity, he was quite a novice or a noob, call him what you want. And he struggled to make a mark. However, once he made it to a tier 1 team, he immediately started playing in majors, Riyadh and the International. He managed to qualify for huge tournaments, but unfortunately has yet to achieve any success. Perhaps this year Watson will become not only the top 1, on the ladder but also the top one in some tournament. And now my friends, let's talk about the new update in Dota 2, and no, it's not the event that we were promised. Recently there have been numerous rumors in the community about the new upcoming patch, the new hero and some events related to it. But it turned out to be just a big scam from Valve. We literally got nothing but a seasonal treasure. By the way, speaking of it, let's take a look inside. Personally, for me, this is one of the rare treasure sets that is really good. I mean, I like all of the sets inside, except for Dark Willow, but don't judge me, guys. I think all of these are just cool. They're detailed, they're fun, they have like lore or story or something hidden behind and I really like the visuals. Anyways, I had only like 12k Dota points and guess what, I opened one chest and I got the Dark Willow set, the only one I didn't want, so Gaben, thanks. Share in the comments below which one did you get. But the update itself with new settings really caught my interest. Valve introduced Dota Lab, where they will test different settings or add and remove something. For now, among cool features we can see a more noticeable health bar and a new full screen minimap. It does look cool and useful for me, but you have to like adjust to it. And it's more a thing of a choice, because someone likes it, but others don't, and that's okay. You can tweak the game however you like. But the most interesting innovation is the interactions with units and heroes, like the new binds. What do they do? Let's say you're playing Oracle and want to cast a heal on your teammate, but all the enemy heroes are standing in the way, interrupting you. Clicking on an ally is extremely difficult in such a situation, but now with the new bind for interacting only with your ally heroes, we can avoid misclicks and not catch 9 reports. It's a very good and useful feature, in my opinion, because because it also helps against heroes like Broodmother or Beastmaster, who are like surrounded by creeps and you have to like aim as hell. Next, let's talk about reshuffles, and we will start with Team Secret. Poppy decided to kick Eki out. The news wasn't exactly unexpected. I think everyone understood that it was time to start changing the roster, and this time Secret's position 4 was one to go. It's unclear who Poppy plans to recruit for his team now, but according to the player himself, neither Saxa nor Yabzer will be joining the team. Guys, I mean, share your guesses in the comments below. Who do you think will take on the role of the position 4 in Team Secret? By the way, Resolution was planning to play support, so maybe he's gonna be back? ATF has named the best offlaner in the world, and surprise surprise, it's not him. According to Amar, Miero is currently the strongest in this position. It's not just about individual play, it's about how the team has started performing thanks to him and his impact. And of course, the offlaner from Badboom has significantly improved his gameplay. Amar also shared some tips on how to set yourself up for victory. Listen up guys, it's pretty important. First, we need to learn to always play to the end, because our life is on the line. We learn discipline and stay focused throughout the game, as most opponents can make mistakes, which is what we capitalize on. That's basically how the comeback system works in Dota 2. This strategy is clean as a whistle and as simple as a log, 
works, so just do it and follow a Mars tip. ATF, by the way, also told where the idea of dropping the mantles of intelligence came from. He said that he simply copied the actions of one 4K MMR player. This was four years ago when Amar himself was playing at the lower tier, and it's not surprised that he got this idea from such a low rating, to be honest. Now let's talk about Arteezy. He apparently and finally has regained his old form, or at least that's what two Chinese legends, Chalice and Somnus, believe in. It's hard to argue with that, considering the results of Shopify Rebellion at Dream League. We will cover their matches in our analysis segment later. But honestly, in my opinion, all the successes is tied to the fact that Fly's aggressive playstyle complements Arteezy perfectly. He always supports him in fights and, if necessary, always know how to hold him back. Back, and that works. And that's honestly so nice to see. And yeah, also Arteezy shared his feelings about his new team. According to the pro player, he has found his second wind. He completely rethought team building, tactics, and has felt a renewed sense of purpose in the game. However, things are only this rosy in official matches. In scrims, it's a bit worse, or a lot worse. As Arteezy himself said, all his teammates unbelievably feed and ruin his game during screams, especially Yopaj. But since they're showing decent results in official matches, the mid laner's tendency to feed during practice is forgivable. Guys, what do you think? Are they just trolling Arteezy? Leave your comments below. Now let's talk about some DDoS attacks and things that Valve decided to tell us. The true old-timers of Dota remember how in 2014 and 2015 there were some server problems with Dota, and in a recent blog post they revealed what happened. The story of this battle with hackers is quite extensive, but I'll highlight the most interesting parts. It all started back in 2014, when Valve's security system was relatively weak, allowing almost any determined individual to DDoS the company. At that time, the issue wasn't seen as critical until it significantly impacted the International 2015, causing the casters and the players experience problems connecting to matches. Fortunately, the problem was solved, surprisingly, by a simple yet ingenious solution. They just planted some intermediary servers that filtered all players and blocked a large influx of suspicious accounts. This simple, straightforward, but brilliant idea not only saved Dota, but Steam as a whole, as they use this system everywhere now. Of course, it's been 10 years since, and Valve made many improvements to this system. And of course, if you want to read the whole story, just visit Valve's Dota 2 blog and read it yourself. Now let's turn to something really fun. A fight broke out between the mid laner and carry of Team Falcons. Of course, there was no real reason, perhaps a minor quarrel or just trolling each other, but that was really fun and they decided to go old-fashioned. But guys, if you don't know, Melrin was raised in a small town somewhere really, really far away and he, like, spent a lot of time with wild animals and domesticated animals and all that. So he's basically no stranger to these things and he easily took down Skitter. It was just hilarious. As the Falcon's carry explained later, they were just fooling around like real brothers, and it was kinda cute. Now to some serious stuff. Valve has finally spilled the beans on where and when the International will take place, delivering the news in their signature poetic flair. They talked about the war banners being washed clean of bloodstains and scorch marks, trumpets being tested for their ability to sound the imminent approach of battle, lanes getting swept clean of body parts, and all that, you know Valve. Of course, this was all just a beautiful lead up to the real deal announced just below. The preparations are in full swing for the upcoming The International, set to unfold in the Royal Arena, meaning we're heading to Copenhagen, Denmark. As for the timings, they've opted for the onset of autumn. Given that the autumn qualifiers for Dream League are scheduled for September 22 to 26, we will most likely see the International before that, meaning that it will start like on September 1st or something like that. But also, knowing Valve, they might mean October, because like in America, summer ends on on September 27th. 
And yeah, guys, of course, surely this announcement is exciting and all that, but where's the event? What the hell? We want the Ringmaster. We want some PvE challenges and the Labyrinth and all that. Please, Valve, what the hell? You promised us a long time ago. Am I right? I'm definitely not the only one who thinks like that. Well, yeah, I shouldn't let anger distract me from the news, so let's get back to it. Now we've got the when and the where, but what about the teams? Here's what Valve themselves wrote. The more teams that are eligible to participate in a tournament, the higher our consideration. Cross-regional tournaments generate more useful data than intra-regional tournaments. Tournaments with qualifiers generate more useful information than only invitational tournaments, and etc. Meaning basically that international tournaments with open qualifiers are better. However, let's be real, that's often just talk. Here are the current team rankings according to the Glico 2 system that Valve really likes, and most probably they will use it for the invitations. And as you can see, the list is dominated by the usual suspects. I am not sure how many teams Valve will invite according to this list, but like 6, 8, 10? I don't really know, but we will see. And to maintain their rankings, each team on the list will have to play through qualifiers, not skip any tournaments, meaning the coming months will be jam-packed with action. But unfortunately, don't expect to see many new up-and-coming teams here making the cut. Maybe their last chances will be the open qualifiers or something like that. Now, Yetro has clarified for us why Spirit's matches are so prolonged and why things seem so tough. According to the player, the dragons make a lot of mistakes early in the game, consistently throw and give away all their advantage, which basically leads to the game dragging into the late stages. Where Spirit, by the way, also can make mistakes. However, thanks to all these intense games, they also gain experience and understanding of how to play in the late game. Well, honestly, that was a lot of news, so now let's turn our attention to some games, because they were just decent, amazing and very interesting. And since we were just talking about Team Spirit, let's start with them. And it's the match between Team Spirit and OG. In my opinion, Seb and his team are a relatively easy opponent for Yadro, but let's see how the Dragons will perform. Right off the bat on the first map, we see some solid drafts from Spirit. Moreover, they have handled their lanes pretty well, with Yadro and Laurel accumulating a lot of net worth, making the game much easier for the Radiant. Spirit secured the Aegis and execute a successful smoke into the enemy's jungle, where they take an excellent fight and claim half of the enemy's woods. The Dragons just significantly outfarmed their opponents, and with massive net worths on Naga and Leshrac, Seb and his team found it impossible to play. All that was left for them is for some reason endure, feed and hope for the best, and for miracles. But nothing happened. Mira played excellently on his Shadow Demon. He prevented every single Void's try to turn the game around. After another failed fight, OG called GG. And the second mob delighted us with an amazing strategy from Tim. Spirit, a Terror Blade position 4, extremely rare in official matches and usually doesn't really work out well. But maybe Spirit had been practicing a lot with this hero, and it seems that the position 4 Terror Blade is actually pretty strong. The dragons won all their lanes, although they started to fit as the game progressed, but it didn't really affect their current advantage. The team fights in the mid game were quite equal, with a lot depending on their mid laners. If Puck catches Void Spirit, the fight is in favor of the dragon and basically vice versa. But somehow OG managed to find Yatro wandering around. And while Sven is dead, the Radiant take down a tier 3 tower. Mira tried to defend with the refractions, but he was burst down in an instance. It seems that this strategy didn't quite work out in the late game and in defending their base. But on the second attempt, Seb's charges were successful and they breached the high ground and even took a fight. Just look at this symphony of skills happening here. In my opinion, Seb and his team delivered a very high level of play on this map. OG take down the dragons on the second one and the fate of spirit will be decided on the third map. But here, Yadaro and his team just finally outplayed Sap. They outdrafted and outdominated all the lanes. The dragons did everything right at the start and at the end of the game. Naturally, all their efforts paid off as Dyer began making numerous mistakes, positioning themselves for the most obvious plays and generally performing wars. The dragons pushed into the Dyer's high ground, took down the top lane, and retreated after TB's metamorphosis ended. But even though they managed to retreat, a 
few minutes later they lost two of their most important cores. It's unclear what Laurel was hoping for when right clicking Lashrug, but definitely he managed to feed alongside with Yadro, so he just wasn't feeling himself bad, alone. Fortunately for OG, they have a wonderful carry who will just jump into the fight and sacrifice himself for the sake of the team. Or or why, or what was the reason. Anyways, Yadro is fearlessly brawling with Sven, while Dire Heroes just died after buybacks. And with that, the game essentially ended. Congratulations to Spirit on advancing to the final stage of the Dream League, while OG are out. It seems that the dragons were just shaping up at the start of the group stage, and now they're good. Otherwise, I can't describe the game they're showing now. Team Spirit has significantly improved their play, and I believe they rightfully made a comeback in their group points. And Bad Boom Team was among the first to feel the heat of Dragon Breath. On the first map, the dragons managed to gain an advantage. They won all the lanes and disrupted all of Void's timings. All that was left was just to farm key items and finish the game. But Radiant decided not to give Team Spirit an easy win, finding an easy target in Laurel, then taking a superb fight in which they took down three more heroes. And that was basically the end of any significant and superb action. The teams only made a couple of pickoffs on supports and that's all, no more major fights. Yatero just spent the entire Aegis duration finishing his items. This is roughly what the basic fight on this map looks like. Sven is easily kited and after his BKB he gets beaten down, his teammates just try to escape. Even the battle for the second Roshan can hardly be called spectacular. Nightfall lands a Chronosphere on two enemy cores and Dire has nothing left but to back off. But even with Aegis on Void, Badbomb couldn't make a high ground push. Both teams farmed for better times and waited for others to make the first move. The game would have lasted forever if not for the fights over Roshan. But with Aegis, Radiant's fights just don't pan out. GPK gets completely lost in his buttons after buying back and flying back in. Honestly, it was more of a circus than a fight. Spirit did well to defend, exceptionally well. They even managed to take down a lane and escape. However, they gave up the Aegis and the game went past 60 minutes, leaving it unclear who would win the map. Basically, Yarrow can chop Nightfall in two hits, and while he has plenty of damage, if he gets caught in a Chronosphere, he's definitely dead. And here, Void places an excellent Chronosphere, catching two heroes without buybacks. Oh. Oh, that's a huge Chrono! They actually find all three! Not gonna focus on the Sven first, they get the Batrider who no longer has buyback. Mira is next, and Yatoro gets bashed by the Aghanim Scepter. Yules is gonna keep him alive for the time being. Gonna be forced away. That is the Aegis still intact. But Nightfall and company should be able to... What else do you need to finish such an intense game? Right, he nearly died to two enemy heroes, which likely wouldn't have mattered since he had buyback and could easily purchase boots of travel. But thanks to a whole lot of damage, Nightfall easily erases the dragon's base. After such a fierce battle, Bad Boom team seemed to lose their momentum. On the second map, Miero just got his Lycan, who is not the meta at all, and predictably they lost in 30 minutes. And the last map was even quicker for Nightfall than the second one. Radiant hardly managed to put up any resistance. The dragons simply walked into the high ground like it was their own home base and demolished it. But you know what guys, this one for Bad Boom wasn't really crucial or of any significance, because they already advanced from the group stage. However, I personally tend to think that the dragons simply outplayed their opponents. Indeed, the match against Shopify was just as much of a free game over two maps. Honestly, after RTZ managed to draw against the dragons, I thought they could potentially win, but it turned out that Shopify hasn't reached the necessary level yet. And they made some mistakes in their drafts. I think everyone has seen enough of Spirits by now, let's rather check out who else advanced from the group stage. Let's start, for example, with Falcons. Honestly, I just adore this team. Skitter and his gang simply steamrolled everyone in their group. To give you an idea of their strength, throughout all the matches in the second group stage, they lost only one, and that was because of the match that really didn't matter. In my opinion, Falcons are the ultra favorites in this tournament. 
Let's analyze their match against Extreme Gaming and understand what sets them apart from other teams. If you look at all their matches, you'll immediately notice that Falcons have a wide array of Tier 30 heroes. This means that almost each player has their signature heroes in drafts. And moreover, they have like 4 or 5 signature heroes for each position. But that's not all. The way they move around the map and maintain their positioning in fights also deserves attention. In all their drafts, they have one to reliable initiators and a hero that can deal a lot of damage. And of course, discipline. Even though the guys like to tip their opponents and engage in some trash talk, they're just super cool and they know what to do. And they always follow the plan. In the game itself, they play very measuredly and don't give their opponents easy opportunities to come back. In my opinion, this is what currently makes Falcons the strongest team and of course wins them games. Next up, Bad Boom. The guys actually showed a pretty good performance. They took down Extreme, Shopify and the Gladiators. The only two teams that managed to overcome them were the Ultra Favorites Falcons and the Enraged Team Spirit. But even considering the two unpleasant losses, they were able to advance to the upper bracket, which is quite an achievement. While Team Spirit brought some kind of a negative surprise, to be honest, their drafts were lackluster and their rotations strange. However, in the last few matches, Yetter and his team managed to fully redeem themselves and turn around their statistics. In my opinion, they also have a pretty good chances of at least reaching the tournament's finals, because it seems like they're gradually getting back into their old form. But we'll have to see how they perform in the playoffs. And the last team to make it to the playoffs is Extreme Gaming. They demolished GG in the final deciding match for the spot in the playoffs. Let's take a look at this battle, by the way. On the first map, Tofu brought out that very terrible late position 4 he's been spamming in pubs. And it seemed to work quite well. He was winning the lanes and moving around the map efficiently. Quite a position 4, but never in my pubs, unfortunately. But honestly, we can't keep praising Tofu all the time, as the Gladiators supports were just fading, wandering around the map aimlessly, to be honest. But even so, everything was going well for Quinn and his gang until this fight. Here, gaming gladiators are sitting up on the high ground, or were... Not gonna break it right away. That. Jin Q are gonna get some information. Oh, oh XXS got all of these heroes inside of the arena. He's gonna try and bulwark protect himself. What a great earth splitter on top of that one. The RP does go out with the Rolling Thunder. Duraccio laying into this Mars, Not but he's taking enough. a lot thanks to the bulwark, thanks to the infest. XXS is too big to be brought down. Not even Quinn can finish. What an incredible arena from Mars with Extreme Gaming earning themselves 5k gold from this excellent fight. And that's where the game fell apart part for GG. The Radiant just completely lost their way after this unsuccessful fight. They started to move strangely across the map and began to feed. Ame and his team executed another successful fight, forcing buybacks from the opponents. All that was left was to wait for the next suitable moment to go high ground and finish the game. They do have the swap. swap, of course, and they're gonna use it now. First life goes down, XXS makes his presence known. Arena plus the Shiva's BKB trying to tank up oh. against Zorachio. Got him in the RP with the two of them, but the Infest is on the troll right now. And he actually dies to Ame coming out of that Infest. He just bursted down the troll. He has no buyback, so Quinn has to do all of the lifting here, but he just can't do enough damage by himself. Double buyback from Game, and they need oh, to come in here with the Yules. Again, but the Yules again and again, they just keep on countering Ace's contribution to a team fight. Another buyback, but again, how are you? Extreme Gaming didn't have to wait long for the next fight, and they easily won it, and the game as well. The second map turned out to be much more intense. Extreme Gaming dominated the early game, taking down towers and generally having everything going their way. However, Duraccio was also doing well, and they managed to catch TB, and he absolutely couldn't afford to die there. But Ame's mistake didn't particularly ruin the game for the Chinese team. They secured Aegis, fought well, and pushed into the Radiant's high ground. GG were just waiting for Duraccio to farm the Revenant's Bruge on Phantom Assassin to fight to become much easier. And that's basically what happened. Radiant fought back well, even forcing buybacks from Legion Commander and Robek. They just couldn't break through and dived too deep. But from this moment on, TB began to face significant problems. Just look how Ame crumbles to Phantom Assassin. It's honestly unclear what Dyer was hoping for when they went high ground without Aegis or any backup. But the game 
game clearly shifted in favor of the gladiators. Or, well, it seemed so to me. Extreme Gaming just got mega creeps for gladiators testing Quinn and his team. And they passed it, as Ami just died to a PA crit and catching the rest of the heroes was not a problem. At that point, PA got a rapier and it was really hard for TB to survive. It seemed like the greatest comeback from the gladiators was on the horizon. As funny as it sounds, the comeback was ruined by a single dagger from Phantom Assassin. Anton Duraccio died from one crit on the Tormentor and had to buy back. Of course, all dire heroes were just still dying from one crit, but now Duraccio couldn't afford any mistakes at all. GG pushed into the opponent's high ground, forced out buybacks, and everything was decided in the greatest fight of all time. I'm in right now. A dagger until he clears some of these illusions. They start he going for it. The tear wave goes out. They manage to get the duel. The duel. At no the same save. time as the tear wave, but it doesn't matter. They get him anyway. Quinn going on. Throwfoot's going for it. Can they do the damage? Can they do the damage? Try to finish it up. The damage dealers are gone. They don't have their heroes. They don't it's have the five backs. It's not enough. They hold unless Ace can pull a miracle out of his ass. He's making a run for it. He's not going to make it out. And Ame. Book of Shadows, Ame's going for the Ancient. You flee dire side, but your home is in trouble. How was it Ame not and enough? XM will finish it up. They'll take the Ancient. How did it go? Both teams delivered an insane match, but this time we'll be watching the playoffs of Dream League without gaming gladiators. You can see the entire playoffs bracket on your screens right now. Feel free to write in the comments below who you're rooting for and who you think will be the top one in this tournament. And finally, that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching the video until the end, I can't even express my feelings. Don't forget to hit that like button and follow our channel and also leave the comments. I read all of them, like all of them, so thank you again. You've been watching the best Dota 2 news channel. I'm not saying goodbye for a long time. See you soon.